Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Brad Chamberlain. This is our service for April 23rd, 2023. Today we are continuing our series on 1 Peter, a letter written by Simon Peter to the churches of Asia Minor, just at the onset of significant persecution. Within these verses is a call to remembering the past honestly, even the hard parts, even our mistakes, even our struggles, and from that to enter into the present with humility and empathy, to learn to truly walk with others in love, not with judgment or agenda, but to love unconditionally. Let's join in this responsive call to worship. Come, lift your voices to the Lord who always hears us. Listen, Lord, hear our voices, sing your praises. Call on the Lord who bends low to hear us. Listen, Lord, we lift our voices to you in praise. Call on the name of the Lord, all people. Lord, we call on you, for you saved us, you raised us, and turned our lives around. Let your name be praised. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-25. to 25. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God, because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it, has come, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Offerings may be given by check to the address shown or online at umcmagnolia.com. Let's pray for this week's offering. Creator of all we know and all we don't know, as we bring our gifts this day, we ask you to help us trust you more. Forgive us when we entertain the thought that our future lies in bank balances and the accumulation of stuff. Remind us, as Peter reminded the early followers, that through Jesus we have come to trust God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. May our lives reflect that trust to others. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's join in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, when we remember the journey of our faith, the story that we live with you and one another, we recall all the ways we have missed the mark. We have failed to live our Christian story well. We have neglected to listen to and believe the stories of our neighbors. We have ignored how to contribute to the heart, how we contribute to the hardships that exist in our community. We have turned away from the needs of the poor. We have shied away from the suffering of our neighbors. We have valued independence over interdependence and connection. In so many ways, big and small, our lives have not demonstrated our testimony of new life in Christ. And now let's pray silently, confessing our sins before God. Hear the good news. Out of God's great love for us, we have been ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus. Christ loosens the bonds of sin so that we may live our story of exuberant praise for the God who saves through radical love for God and one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 
Our Old Testament reading is from Psalm 116, verses 1 to 9. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death and he saved me. Let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. He has saved me from death my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. Have you ever had someone approach you about their faith and felt like you were nothing more than a mark to them, a number? Like your value to them was only in your potential to buy their product or to be like them or to believe exactly what they believe. It's super annoying, isn't it? I remember back as a college student, I was walking through the university district here in Seattle. I was a young, kind of depressed kid, uncertain of my place in the world. Things were kind of foggy. And somebody called me to me from a doorway as I passed, telling me that I could come in and take a free psychological exam, which would really help me. I was a people pleaser, and I was <laughs> stupid, and I didn't want to say no, so I followed the person upstairs into what was the Dianetics office. I had no clue about Scientology at that point. They gave me some sort of psychological examination form to fill out, and then they looked it over, and they acted concerned. They recommended that I meet with one of their counselors right away. I did. And the counselor proceeded to explain to me that my results showed that I was very depressed and would probably kill myself. I think it said something like 80% of people with your statistics kill themselves. And I needed to make some kind of significant changes. And just by chance, <laughs> they had all the answers. Well, it freaked young me out. I shut down. <laughs> I, I don't know, I took a brochure or something and I just kind of walked out, ignoring their earnest pleas for my well-being. I was frazzled. I wasn't suicidal, but they confused me. Am I? Maybe I am. What if I am? It was super manipulative. It was super unethical. It was using devious means to undermine my con confidence, what little I had, and to win my faith to their system without any regard for who I actually was as a human, what my actual needs were, without any relationship to me other than just as a mark. And, you know, we've all had Jehovah's Witnesses knock on the door. I assume everyone's heard the pitch a few times in their lives. And... It's annoying. Everyone thinks it's annoying, right? Don't tell me what to believe. Wendy had a friend in Santa Cruz whose uncle would see the JWs approaching and would strip down and answer the door naked just to scare them off. Okay. Have you ever been in those kinds of situations where someone seems to believe that they have all of the answers and that you are somehow deficient? It's a feeling of condescension, a lack of respect of objectification, even if, from their perspective, it's meant as an act of love, just comes across as judgment and belittling. And, you know, so much arrogance on their part. As we move into this sermon series on First Peter, we will also be looking at how we best share God's love in the situations and communities where we each have been placed. Do our words and actions with our family members, with our kids, with our co-workers or our parents or our friends or with the guy at the coffee shop, do we ever come across that way? As if we think we have all the answers, as if we are bulletproof and they are deficient, as if we say we love them, but all we're communicating is judgment. And if so, mightn't their, resp mightn't their response be the same kind of anger resentment, emotional wall, which we experience when others do that to us. 
So remember, we're on 1 Peter. It was written to the young church across Asia Minor, people who were very marginalized and who were facing heavy persecution from the surrounding Roman society in the wake of the fires in Rome and Nero's actions to scapegoat the crisis onto all Christians. Peter is writing to them and explaining not how to be saved or even anything about salvation itself. But given that you are saved, these are the results. This is what you got to do. What happens to us when we shed our dependence on self, when we yield control to the Spirit? That's what he's writing about. What happens when our chains have been removed? What was the point of Jesus ransoming us? What are we ransomed individuals to do? Just go on with life as it was? How are we meant to respond? He is building them up. He's building them up for what's coming. You are saved for eternity. And these present sufferings, they're finite. Live for eternity now, even in this hard place where you've been placed. Not as martyrs, but as love. Here is how, even in this crushingly difficult situation, you can manifest Christ's love in the world in response to what's been done for you. He hearkens them back in verse 18 to their previous empty life. He brings them back to reminiscing on the actual changes in their own lives, to the testimonies of their own lives. Because perhaps as they struggle with the situation where they've been placed, they are thinking back to what seemed like greener pastures of the past, wishing they'd never have been exiled here in this horrible place and time. <laughs> makes me think of Wendy's grandmother sharing with us that God's love is witnessed most strongly, not through logical argumentation or four simple rules or theological teaching or even through the Bible. It's found in the reality of changed lives. And we see those changed lives in individuals' responses to being set free. If we are honest about our past, we can look back and see our own changed lives. And we can see the changes in how we respond to being set free. And so, that's what we need to consider together. What is our response to being set free? A significant part of our response to being set free is actually to remember. Remember what life was actually like before we experienced this freedom. A lot of church traditions, people tell their testimonies often as part of this. It's a call to remembering the past as it really was, though. Not some sanitized version, as many testimonies turn out to be. Not in some glorified version, but really remember the past. Think of the Israelites during the Exodus. They kept wanting to go back to the past, back to the chains in Egypt because they were forgetting about the chains and the whips and the lack of freedom and simply remembering a time when they had homes and routine and steady food. Why can't we go back to that time when we had everything, they complain, while blocking out the fact that they were slaves, the abuses they and their loved ones had faced on a daily basis. If they had learned to let go of the past, then they could have gotten on with following God, with experiencing God in the moment. Maybe it wouldn't have taken 40 years in the desert. But they were not remembering the actual past. They were just being nostalgic. They weren't remembering the reality of life, what it was really like when they were slaves. They were living in a false memory of the past, which sounded way better than it actually had been. And as they lived in that past reality, they were not present to God's activity in their lives in the here and now. And they were less and less appreciative to God for the miraculous grace which had led them out of Egypt. We do this. We put on our rose-colored glasses as we look at the past. <laughs> There's this quote I heard on a podcast, and I noted it down because I really liked it. And so I looked it up while writing this sermon, and <laughs> it turns out it comes from Bojack Horseman. So this is probably the one and only time I'll be quoting from that peculiar TV show during a sermon. But it's a great quote. It says, when you are looking through rose-colored glasses, all the red flags just look like flags. We put on our rose-colored glasses 
and all we see is a sanitized version of the past and think that it was some sort of golden age for everyone, when in fact it wasn't. We do this for our own lives, for our kids, for our church, relationships, places we've lived. On the horizon, on that receding horizon, the details grow so much more thin, and we end up just seeing the beauty of the fading sun. Forget all the other stuff. In verse 18, Peter is reminding the readers that they were ransomed from an empty life inherited from their ancestors. Remember the reality of where you came from. Remember the hardships of the past. Don't wax nostalgic about how things were for your forefathers in exile in Babylon or for your parents who lived in Asia Minor before you and, this, and before this current persecution started. Don't forget about the struggles you've had in your own life. Be honest about the past. Don't fantasize about some glory days gone by. And so we are called to respond to our salvation by being honest about where we've been and where we've come from. Because if we aren't honest about our own broken history, there's a lot that we lose. We lose the ability to see God's grace. We lose the ability to live humbly. We lose our ability to empathize. And we lose our ability to respond to the salvation we've received through seeking forgiveness. I mean, if we only remember the good stuff that we've done, what would we ever need to seek forgiveness for? <laughs> Remembering the past allows our response to our salvation to be one in which we are seeking forgiveness, not just to seek forgiveness from God for the grace that is always with us, but to seek forgiveness from the people we have hurt with our actions, with our judgment, with our words, through our neglect and our indifference. Even as we've lived, even as we've lived these lives of faith, we have each surely left a line of people with pain in their hearts in our wake. We can't just block that out and remember only the good stuff. The response we are asked for involves remembering and seeking forgiveness. And if we are honest about how we remember our past, we are aware of our own brokenness and our own lack of superiority. We do not have all the answers. We aren't meant to have all the answers. We have not lived the exemplary life of Jesus. We have each left mounds of wreckage in our wake, here or there. And I don't say this as some prompt of guilt, but a prompt for response. The response of seeking forgiveness as we remember. And then, as we live this moment, acknowledging the reality of our own frailty, it allows us now to walk humbly to live with empathy for others. We read in verse 22 that you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as sisters and brothers. Because of the love we've been shown, we are able to love others, walking beside them, caring, being a listening ear, being a comforting touch. We don't fix it. We simply love. I struggled through this in the path. I'm still struggling, we can say. You, friend, are struggling as well. Let's walk together in this struggle. And so we're meant to approach everyone as an equal before God. Not as if we are some kind of superior beings because of our faith. This posture, this posture of humility, it radically moves us from the wall-building, self-righteous know-it-all like what I was mentioning earlier at the Dianetics office, and instead to truly embrace everyone with humility and empathy. We are all in this together. We all need to be set free. We respond by remembering the reality of the past, of our past, of our church's past, so as to keep an honest perspective about who we are and how we are not the ones writing this story of our lives, but we are living lives written by the Holy Spirit. And remembering reveals the forgiveness we need to seek, and it enables us to walk humbly. 
with empathy towards others. In verse 22, we are called to this kind of love, sincere love to each other as sisters and brothers. And it continues, love each other deeply with all your heart. This kind of sincerity requires personal honesty and humility. It requires honest reflection. How are we able to do this? <laughs> How could those persecuted Christians in Asia Minor possibly do this? Certainly not by our own fortitude, not by ourselves. But we are able to do this only through Christ's strength, only because we have been born from above. We have been born into eternity. Flowers will die, but the word of God remains forever. Christ remains forever. I imagine, I imagine the eternal love inside of us, which we are sharing in the world, as flowers which will never die, but remain within us in bloom, in full bloom forever, carried within your heart, handed out to others on this path as you walk together with them. Imagine these verses from the perspective of the Christians who first read it, those persecuted Christians of Asia Minor. You are about to be persecuted. Love everyone. People you know will die. Love everyone. Don't wish you were in a different place in time. Life in this world is never perfect. But, God, but God's love is within you right now. You are saved. In verse 23 it says, You have been born again, not to a life that will quickly end. You are in a long game. Even now you exist within eternity and you are grounded in the word of God, grounded in Jesus. It's not a call to martyrdom. It's a call to radical love. It's a call to humility, to seeing ourselves in others and at the same time recognizing God's image in all of God's created people. Okay. Last week, I had us look at communities in which we are each involved, and I asked you to consider the joys and struggles of the people within some of those communities, not from your perspective, but from what you've heard the people in those communities share. This week, I want you to remember, I want you to remember what has brought you joy in the past, as well as what you have struggled with in the past, or are struggling with now. Consider what it might look like to enter into these relationships with the people in your life, in these different communities, including your family, kids, coworkers, whoever. Not as someone who, because you're a Christian, has it all figured out, who can fix it all, but simply as a loving friend, as a fellow pilgrim in this life. What might it look like to remember the past honestly and then say, I struggled through this in the past. I'm still struggling. You are struggling. Let's walk together in this struggle. What would it look like to not want to fix things, but simply to minister love, humility, and empathy, and to allow God to be in control? To trust not just your life to God, but to trust their life to God, and then simply walk together in eternal love. God will bring completion. We are simply asked, we are simply asked here and now to act in love. Join together for our affirmation of faith. We are not alone, we live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
receive the benediction. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, we read that we have been cleansed from our sins when we obeyed the truth. And so now, cleansed from our sins, may you go out from here showing sincere love to everyone as sisters and brothers. May you love the people whom God has placed into your life deeply and with all of your heart. Go and be love and light. Amen.